Welcome to this week's edition of Conversations. We're talking with University of Mississippi professor Elisa Burton Steele. She's also the author of Delta Jewels in Search of My Grandmother's Wisdom, a book that captures the lives and joys and struggles of women from her grandmother's generation. Elisa, welcome to Conversations. Thank you, Marshall. I'm happy to be here. Okay. Yeah, you are happy to be here. You're happy to be in Mississippi. And of course, you never probably dreamed when you were a little girl living with your grandmother that you would end up one day in Mississippi mm -hmm. telling stories. No. Um, totally not on my radar at all, but I'm glad that I'm here. Yeah. My life has changed. It has changed. It has been, but it's been a great adventure. Now, tell me a little bit about your grandmother, because she was an incredibly strong woman, wasn't she? She was a very strong woman. We, we butted heads a lot, but she was maybe five foot two, maybe 110 pounds soaking wet, and she ran that house. Yeah. And we, very, very strict. I you know, every church every Sunday. Yes. If I didn't go to church, I couldn't go out with my friends the next weekend. If I didn't do my chores, I couldn't go out with my friends. Um, had to go to church with stockings on. Mm -hmm. And so I thought when I was younger, I'll just rip all my stockings. And I thought that would prevent church, but she would drive me to the convenience store, whatever was open. And whatever color stockings they had, that's what I wore, whether they matched or not. So she's a very, very strong woman, and I miss her. Let me write that down. Uh, stockings do not prevent church. That's good to know. <laughs> that's yes. important on that. Very strong. And, of course, y'all butted heads about your first love, photography. Yes. Yeah. She was worried that I wouldn't be able to, to have a career. She was worried that I wouldn't be able to make a living. Yeah. And she wanted me to pick a real major, so... She, you know, she was very excited that I wanted to do it in high school, but right. that's not the career she wanted. She told me to pick a real major, so I picked journalism, writing, mm -hmm. and I kept missing photography, yeah. so I dropped out. You dropped out. I dropped out before I was kicked out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, I, I wanted to spend more time with my family. Yeah, that, that you sound like <laughs> one of the football coaches on that. Yes. But you did, and, but you came back. You went back to college. I went back to college. Yeah. I was in my late 20s, and then I went back to grad school approaching 40. So it, it was much easier the second time around. It was on yeah. my terms. Exactly. And I got to study what I wanted to study. And you made, of course, the... You know, I love where you're talking about your internships. You ended up going to probably one of the coldest places on the planet. Michigan. Michigan, yeah. On the yes. beach, but in the winter. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I picked a beach town in the winter. It was a smart move. So it was very appropriate that you would end up coming down south. Yes, and I yeah. hate the hot weather. So, you know, it's hard to keep me happy. Uh, I, I'm not a fan of Mississippi summers. It's, oh, and you, it's, it's hot. And naturally you picked a, a place like the Delta to go. Yes, <laughs> yeah. right in the middle of the heat. Exactly. So the women in the book, they talk about uh, heat monkeys, yeah. which was the hot air reaching the low air, and you can see the wave of heat on the gravel, Yeah. and that's exactly what I saw a lot of. Definitely. When you can see the heat, that's not a good thing. No. Not a good thing. Suffocating. Well, your, your photography career took you to Dallas, which you were actually involved with the photo team for Hurricane Katrina, because I think that's a great story. Yes, well, Dallas Morning News was my dream paper, yeah. and I was on the job for two months. Two months? Maybe three, two. It was two months when Katrina, I, my job was a night photo editor. I yeah. picked the pictures for the night, for the paper the next day, and I was watching the news, and it just sounded like Katrina was going to be bigger than we anticipated, and we had always had a plan that we were going to send photographers right. to New Orleans and Mississippi, actually, mm -hmm. too, um, but we weren't going to send them when we did. And I called my boss and I said, I think this is going to be bigger than we anticipate. I think we should send staff now to get there. And he said, you're on the desk, make a decision. So here I am two months on the job and I made the decision. I called staff, we got them out. And, you know, Dallas Morning News was very organized. Some of the photographers were in helicopters. Some of them were on land, drove. We had half our staff there, Mississippi yeah. and Louisiana, covering it, and very talented photographers. You that, made a good call. They won the Pulitzer Prize. Yes. Yeah. The photographers were amazing. Amazing, yeah. and, and to me, it was being out in the trenches and photographing the, the the hard images that they were seeing in the stories. Yeah, I love talking a little bit about your backstory because I think it sets that up so well for what you ended up doing with the book. But you go from Dallas to Atlanta. Yes. And you get a, a leadership role there, but 
you weren't totally happy with how things were going and it kind of pushed you toward graduate school, didn't it? I loved working there and I loved the staff, but I saw that multimedia was having, right. it was starting to become more prevalent in reporting. Right. And management didn't necessarily think that managers needed to know audio and video and how to edit. And I didn't agree with that. So I quit and walked away and went to grad school, Ohio University. Did you think you would get into teaching at that point? No, no. In fact, uh, because of my experience in the newspaper world, the director of the program said, we need to have you teach. Really? So I started teaching layout and design, yeah. and uh, that that's when I got the bug, and that's when I wanted to start teaching. You got the bug. Well, um, how did you end up in Mississippi? I think we all have, all of us who've moved here all have great stories on how we ended up. I mean, I got a random phone call, but how did you well, end up getting here? Well, I was talking to a former colleague, and they, they were hired as an assistant professor in the journalism school, the yeah. Meek School, and talking to me about the dean, Dean Norton, and I wanted to work for him. I wanted to see what Mississippi was about. And my husband was uh, wasn't real thrilled. Yeah. Uh, wasn't real happy with Mississippi, with the history. Was a little afraid of his right. safety and everything. Um, but I just, I fell in love with the campus. Mm -hmm. It was beautiful, and I really liked where the school was going. I liked the dean's vision, and yeah. I wanted to be a part of it. Definitely on that. And of course, it, it kind of set you up for this project, the book, which is fantastic, of course, is Delta Jewels in Search of My Grandmother's Wisdom. Because here we've learned a little bit about your grandmother. We've learned a little bit about your journey to get to Mississippi. So at this point, when you're first starting to teach, you're thinking, okay, I really miss my grandmother and I really miss her wisdom. And well, tell a little bit about how the book came about, because this isn't a commercial venture. This is a personal venture. Totally, totally personal. Didn't have any grants, no sponsors, just started driving. What happened was my grandmother's from South Carolina. Yeah. And she ventured up north to be with her mother, who left with the Great Migration. And my grandmother, we always went to visit her family in South Carolina. And when I went to the Delta to help students with a reporting trip, I saw images that reminded me of my grandmother and her people, yeah. uh, the, the old homes, the fields. It just had, it, it, was, it was pulling me. And I said, oh my gosh, I wish I could call my grandmother and tell her what I'm seeing. It just reminded me of my childhood. And she would passed away 20 years ago. And you know when someone goes, they're gone. But for whatever reason, it just really hit me. And the, I can't even describe that feeling of a sense of loss. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, I have all these skills. I would do anything to hear my grandmother's voice again, but I never recorded it, never really photographed her. It's like the one regret I have as a granddaughter and as a journalist. I just, I thought I had more time. Yeah. And I realized there's still a lot of grandmoms out there. So I'll just go interview other people's grandmothers and record their voices and photograph them and to give them the treatment that I would have given my grandmother. And so I just went on a personal journey, reached out to Bill Luckett from Clarksdale, who helped me find five mm -hmm. pastors. One pastor helped me, another pastor. In the end, I had 19 pastors helping me find the 54 women in my book. I was going to ask you that. How did you end up getting access and getting these women to talk because they're very proud they're very yeah. proud women oh trust yeah. me uh, there's some behind the scenes stories in there they were some of them were very difficult interviews yeah. some of them wanted to talk some gave me 12 minutes some gave me five minutes some gave me three and a half hours it varied depending on the woman but the pastors found the women and yeah. my my stipulations were i wanted women who were over 70. right okay i lowered the age because some women had some very poignant highlights that i wanted in the book but they had to be 70, they had to agree to be photographed, and they had to agree to be recorded. I wanted their voice. Right. And I wanted very poignant stories, not an overview of their life, but just pieces of their life with very personal journeys. Mm -hmm. And so the pastors found the women, and I had to go to church yeah. to meet the pastors. You had to wear stockings. Had to wear stockings. <laughs> yes. <laughs> had to uh, go to church. I had to find the dresses. So you could go out with your friends though the next week. So it worked exactly. out very well. Yeah. Do my chores. Uh, had to have dinner with them. Mm -hmm. Was interviewed by the families, the pastors. Uh, I think the first interview was six hours long. Just 
from going, driving from my house to the Delta, going to church, eating dinner, being interviewed and driving back home was at least a six hour day. That was the very oh, first wow. one. And they wanted to fill me out. What do you want with our stories? Yeah. What do you want with the women? Um, what are you gonna do with them? You know, so I had to explain a lot. It's, it's amazing how engaging people can be in Mississippi, but sometimes it's a mile wide and an inch deep. It takes a while to build their trust, and you did that and it, to your credit very quickly. Thank you. It took about four months to get someone to talk to me. Yeah. And then when That's I started. quick. It is quick. <laughs> yeah. And, I, you know, Marshall, I was just very frank. I was yeah. very, very open. Yeah. I wanted them to know because I wanted to give them the respect that I would have given my grandmother. Right. And it came from a good place. It wasn't that I wanted to take their stories and run away. Yeah. I wanted to tell their stories and I wanted to give back to them. And I never thought the book would get published. It was a personal project. Yeah. I was going to self-publish and give the book to the women as a gift. And one article turned into book offers. And I would say that you gave them a gift. A oh, pretty no, they big gave gift. me a gift. Well, they gave you a gift, too. Yeah. But, yeah. And we'll get to that in just a minute, because I, I really there's some great stories of how it's affected their lives. But I, I want to talk a little bit about the, the whole odyssey to begin with, because this wasn't, you didn't have, like, a big sacks of cash in the back of the car to fund this, or you didn't, I mean, this was just strictly you and a personal odyssey. And nor do you have a back, big background of oral history, so this was, you were making this up as you were going. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, so William, who was my director of photography at the Dallas Morning News, I let him listen to some audio, and he's always, you know, hard on me. Yeah. He's like, your audio is pretty bad. Oh. I thought it was really good. Yeah. He's like, your audio is really bad. You need to get better audio equipment. I didn't have the money. Yeah. Uh, my husband was in grad school at Ole Miss, and it was just my income, and he had an assistantship, but it right. just... I mean, we were so broke. I think when I started interviewing during the summer of 2013, by the time I went back to school, I think we have $49 in the account, literally. Wow. $49. All the money went to gas to pay for yeah. the women. I mean, we had, it was like, okay, do we have fresh fruits and vegetables? Mm -hmm. Or do we eat canned fruits and vegetables that were less expensive so that I could go and interview the women, and I always chose to go interview the women. Let's talk about the women for a minute. Uh, one of my favorites is Velma Moore. <laughs> Velma Moore, um, I want to be Velma Moore when I grow up. I want to be Velma Moore when I grow up. <laughs> She's a feisty, spunky, funky, brave woman who was deeply in love with her husband. Yeah. So uh, mother of 15, 145 grandchildren, you know, I can just go down the st stats of her family, but basically they're a town. Yeah. It's, it's not <laughs> a family, a they're a town. And uh, so she's in church with her husband, Mr. Moore. They were married 49 years. And in the pew behind them, she can hear a woman talking about how handsome Mr. Moore is. Wow. And Mrs. Moore is not happy with that. And so I'm at her house interviewing her, and she's very tight with information. I think after the first hour is when her grandson said, Medea, which is grandma, yeah. did you tell her about the woman you dragged out of church and punched? And I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> Hello? Um, I'm sorry, what? Yeah. And she's like, boy, be quiet. And he, and he said, well, you got to tell her. She said, well, she stuck her lips out. If somebody flirt with your husband like you ain't even there, what for you to do? I pulled her out of church so we could talk about this. And the woman goes, they go outside, and the woman says, well, I didn't know that was your husband, but I meant what I said. And she said, well, I mean what I'm finna do. And she punched her between the eyes, knocked her out. Mrs. Moore's mother comes out of the church, and she says, Velma, you know you're wrong. And she said, Mama, I ain't wrong. I didn't hit the woman in the church. I pulled her outside the church. And I said, well, what did you do after that? And so I keep telling my students, you have to have that that perseverance, you have to have those follow-up questions right. because she would answer a question and that was it. So I had to keep following up to get the story. And she said, I went back in and sat quite comfortably. And it's <laughs> just, you know, and I chose the picture of her because, you know, she's poking out her lips. Yeah. Her attitude is very obvious in the picture. And so I wanted their personalities to come out too. As a compliment to you, you've mastered the ability to storytell visually with the written word. And I've seen you at a TED Talk, which was fantastic. Thank you. That was a TEDx Jackson here recently, Thank and you, you did a great job with that. Thank you. You've, um, it's funny, you're talking about the follow-up questions. There is one person that is not in the book. That you will not name, but she just was like, oh, yeah. yeah. She was like trying to pull teeth, wasn't she? Yes. She is from Indianola, I will say that. And she, she had a wonderful 
spirit, I believe, inside her. But she was, I don't know if it was the process, it was, if it was a stranger, if she didn't want people to know her, her right. business. It was yes, no, yes, no. I could not pull anything. I mean, just anything. Yeah. I couldn't pull anything from her. So she's the only one. I interviewed 55 women, and there were 54 in 54 the book. 54 in the book. Yeah, and it hurt me because I yeah. wanted to interview everyone that said they wanted to be in the book. Yeah. Or everyone that agreed, my idea was that everyone has a story. I can get a story. I can get a couple of stories. One of the stories that I found uh, incredibly inspirational, in fact, I got a little bit choked up, and Mrs. Leola Dillard, 103 from Yazoo City, has to be one of the toughest people on the planet because um, she sacrificed everything in the sake of her children. Oh, my gosh. She's a warrior. Yeah. She's a warrior. She will, she'll be 104 in February. So she's living on this cotton plantation, and she has it in her mind that her children are going to school. Yeah. So she sends her husband to tell the overseer, or the worker, whatever the title was, tell him that our children are going to school. Her husband doesn't say anything, doesn't want to approach the man. Right. So when school starts, she sends her children to school. Wow. The man says, I was looking for your children to work yeah. in the field. She said, oh no, my children are not working in the field. They're going to school. They're going to school. And, and he says, well, I, I need them in the field. And if your children go to school, then all the other black children are gonna wanna go to school. And she said, well, they're gonna go to school but they'll work for you in the evening when they come home from school and they'll work on the weekends. And he, that was not good enough. And right. he said, you're gonna have to make a decision. You either work on the field or you leave. And she said, well, I guess that we're gonna leave. Wow. They took the clothes that they had, the things that they could carry, the, the, the cotton plantation kept the animals yeah. and they walked literally off the field. And all of her children have a college education, yeah. right? And uh, they all have bachelors, some have masters, Cheers. and one has a PhD. Incredible, and she even went back. She went back. Yeah. She graduated the same year that her youngest child graduated from college, and she paid cash for all of their education. She worked three, three to four jobs. Wow, so. she literally changed her family tree. Yes. by herself. Yes, she did. Yes, she's amazing. Yeah. And so like she's loving all of this. I bet. This hype with the book because she had pens made. Uh, we did a book signing in Yazoo City. Mm -hmm. I partnered with Mississippi Delta National Heritage Area mm -hmm. and the Delta Center for Culture and Learning and we did a Delta tour. We picked five cities and we went to Yazoo City. Mm -hmm. We wanted to give the women in Yazoo City some exposure. And she went to the book signing and had pens made and it said Delta Jewel Leola Dillard. And like I grabbed like five or ten of the pens, but and they write really well too. But <laughs> just to see her, you know, at 103 years old yeah. signing books, it just lit my heart, you know. But you you took this lady who had a very tough life and, and made something of it and you've given her fi her 15 minutes. Oh, well. That's, she that's gave, awesome. Thank you, but she gave herself 15 minutes. Oh, she, she did, just, yeah. Yeah, I mean, to me, the glory is for the women. It really yeah. is. And that's yeah. what's so beautiful about the book, because oh. you see that thread running through it, and you celebrate their toughness. And, uh, you know, somebody, and, and I think one of the things I really liked about the book was it told me stories that I haven't exactly read in history books. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really special. One of, them, one of the people is somebody that I've always admired since I've been in Jackson's Merle Evers. <sighs> And Merle Evers drinks from the Fountain of Youth. She has not changed since in the 20 years I've been here, for sure. But you told a story in her about what she was wearing, and I'd never heard that before. Yeah, you know, first I have to tell you, when I, when I, it took me nine months to get her. Nine? Wow. Nine months. It was so worth it, right? Yeah. They say the best things are worth waiting for. So I'm in her office waiting for her to come in, and she comes in, and she says, I only have an hour, and I'm tired. I said, oh boy, this isn't, you know, like, yeah. and she immediately started, started talking about Mr. Evers, which was great. I'll listen to anything oh, she sure. wants to say, but I was there for her. Yeah. And I said, but Mrs. Evers, you were raised by your grandmother too. And then she realizes I'm there for her stories. And one hour turned into three hours. Oh, wow. And she's singing hymns that her grandmother sang and she's sharing all these incredible stories. And the one that just... I never heard anything like this coming from mm -hmm. her. But well, she said, my grandmother raised me. I was literally born, and that day my mother, my grandmother took me 
they lived across, she lived across the street from my parents and she raised me. Mm -hmm. And she said, she, she was a school teacher and she quit teaching to raise me. But when I got older, 12, 13, she decided to go be a housekeeper for a white family in Vicksburg. And every week she would bring home really delicious, rich foods that she had mm -hmm. never had before. But she also brought the young girls clothes from that home. She had her first mink coat when she was 13. In fact, Meg Gravers took a picture of her when she was pregnant in that mink coat. She still had it when oh. she was pregnant with her first child. And, you know, she said, I grew weary of wearing that little girl's clothes. And she said to her grandmother, I want my own clothes. And her grandmother said, well, we can't afford stuff like this. She said, I don't care what you get me. I just want my own clothes. Mm -hmm. Just that sense of pride that she wanted her yeah. own. And her grandmother made her skirts made out of croaker sacks, which are like flower sacks. And she would dye them different colors. And she would make uh, what was called a broomstick skirt. And it was a skirt that wrapped around your waist and you had a little extra on the hip. And she preferred those to the very expensive clothes from what she calls the White House. That's incredible. Yeah. That's incredible. I, um, you know, you think about what, these ladies went through and, and what society was like and, and, and the toughness. And I love how they found ways with humor and toughness to defy the things that were going on. I think Tenny Self of Clarksdale's story is wonderful. She's priceless. Yeah. Um, she's, I think, 89 now. And so in 1949 or 1950, she wants to go buy a Cadillac. Yeah. And the dealership, the local dealership, she wouldn't give me the name said, you don't need to have Cadillac. And so that set her off. Right. So she drove to Memphis and bought a Cadillac. But what I love is that she drove past that dealership in Clarksdale every day, honked the horn and waved. And she said, and I said, toot toot, hello, every day. And I just love that spunk. But she also stormed into the telephone company. Um, she wanted Mrs. next to her name in the telephone book because they would put the white counterparts would have Mrs. next yeah. to their name. And Miss Tinney said, well, I'm Mrs. too, what's the difference? So she literally walked in and demanded that they put Mrs. next to her name in the telephone book, which they started to do after she did that. Wow, wow. Yeah. Virginia Hauer, um, hmm. her story was actually kind of sad and kind of heartbreaking. Yeah. Cause she, uh, well, I, I'll let you tell it cause I think you can do it much better than I can. Well, Mrs. Hauer passed away, uh, I think in October and uh, my family, we were very close to her. It was, uh, you know, it's hard when they start to pass away. Uh, yeah. Five from the book have passed away already. Um, Mrs. Howard was very fair complected. She's mm -hmm. black, but she's very fair complected. And she passed as white. Mm -hmm. She said that if she could ride in the white train, why not? It made her sad that she couldn't speak to her grandparents when she would get off the train, they would want her to wait yeah. so people wouldn't know that she was black. And she would go into a hamburger cafe uh, in Clarksdale and she would go to the front door to get fresh hot food for her family and take it back instead of going to the back door. And so it was very, um, she said it was very, I forgot the word that she said, but it was like very, she called it horror. Yeah. She said, this is horror that I have to do this. But she said, if, if this is what I need to do to get fresh food and to get better treatment, then that's what I'll do. A quote that she used in the TED Talk that I loved was talking about how when, and, and I'll let you give it exactly because I can't paraphrase it, but just talking about what happens when someone like this mm. dies. Susan Glisson told me this quote, which was so poignant. She said that she had heard this quote, when an elder person dies, a library runs yeah. down with it. It's so true. It's very powerful. Yeah, it is. And it makes you want to go and grab your iPhone and go record your grandparents and your parents and get them to tell stories. Absolutely. I mean, we photograph our food, right? I'm so guilty of that. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's got to have the pretty light for the food and we photograph our pets. We photograph our kids. We do video, everything else. But our elders are sitting there and, you know, we need to record them. Yeah. What? Now, what's next for you? Uh, cotton. cotton. Cotton is next. When I was interviewing for Delta Jewels, it always came back to cotton and stories. So I decided to um, focus on any kind of cotton story, black, white, male, female, older, younger, anyone who wants to share very poignant stories, slices of life about cotton. So I'm going to interview in Arkansas, 
Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, maybe some Texas. And you're now a preserver of Mississippi culture. That's according to the Mississippi Humanities Council. Congratulations for the Thank award. Thank you. I'm so honored that the Mississippi Humanities Council just they appreciate the work, they see the value in it. And, you know, I have to give a lot of thanks to uh, Rolando Hertz from the Delta Center for Cultural Learning and the Mississippi Delta National Heritage Area for nominating me. It's, I can't even describe how honored I feel. It's, yeah. uh, it's amazing how just a little dream inside of you can turn into something that it has grown this big. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I it's, appreciate that. And of course, the book is Delta Jewels in Search of My Grandmother's Wisdom. It's fantastic. It makes me want to go home and record my parents. Yes, and, please do. Yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> and everybody else, please go do that because you're right. It's just amazing. And I was thinking about it when you're talking about your grandmother. I, I can remember my grandmother, but I can't remember her voice. Wow. And that's tough. It is tough, Kim. I mean, even just like the smell of her perfume or like, do you remember the food that she would make that was yeah. the, your favorite to eat? It's just little things like that. Yeah. I want to thank Alicia. This is another episode of Conversations, and we will be back next week. Mm -hmm.